this is really hard. He's saying, go back to Egypt where they were trying to kill you. Yeah. And go talk to that wicked dictator, Pharaoh, and try to convince him to let the people go. I don't think that was a job Moses was gunning for, <laughs> you know? So if Jesus is the new Passover lamb, if we approach what Jesus does on, his cro on the cross with a truly biblical lens, we should all be going, well, of course, there should be a meal. Yeah. And what does St. Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 7? Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, therefore, we're saved. No. He says, okay, he's been sacrificed, therefore, we have to celebrate the feast. Exactly. And what's the feast in 1 Corinthians? It's the communion of the body and blood. It's the Eucharist. Welcome to the Bible Timeline Show. I'm Jeff Cavins. Today, we're going to look at that red period on the Bible Timeline chart, and that is Egypt and Exodus. At the beginning of Exodus, 400 years have gone by, and now God is going to free his people. And this is going to become really the central redemptive event in the Old Testament. It is the Passover, and Dr. Edward Sri is going to be joining me in just a moment to really drill down on that Passover and what it meant, what it meant in the New Testament, and then for us today, how do we understand that Passover in the Mass. So if you've ever wanted to really drill down in the Mass and uh, relate it to the Passover and the Paschal Mystery, this is the episode for you. Dr. Edwards Free. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Dave. it's good. You've got a huge title though at Focus, and I spent all morning trying to memorize it. And I still, <laughs> still couldn't. What, what is your full title? <laughs> it's Senior Vice President, uh, let's see if I can get it right, of Apostolic Outreach. And so basically, I'm overseeing all of the things we're doing that's directly related to mission. You talk about transformation, and that's what we're talking about today with the Passover, mm. is 400 years went by between the end of Genesis and the very beginning mm. of, of Exodus, and a lot happened prior to the Passover. Take us back mm. uh, a bit and, and kind of set the table. What does the landscape look like? What, <laughs> what does Israel look like? Because if you're reading the Bible on a weekend, you can go from Abraham to the Exodus pretty quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't, wasn't real quick, was it? Yeah, I, and I know you, you just covered the period of the, of the patriarchs, and you talked about how you know, Joseph is bringing his family into Egypt, and everything looks great. They're dwelling in Goshen, and it's all a happy family reunion. It's wonderful. Well, when you open up <laughs> Exodus, you know, the famous line in ver chapter 1, verse 8, there's a new king in Egypt who did not know Joseph. Yeah. And I always like to highlight that doesn't mean that like he never heard of Joseph. Bad memory. You know, uh, who's this guy? No, no. It's like knowing in that covenantal biblical sense, you know, and like in other words, he's a he's he's opposed to Joseph and Joseph's family. Mm -hmm. He's you know, he's rejecting them and you know he's threatened by them. And it starts off with this dramatic, you know, act of genocide at the beginning. You know, the event eventually he's just just says we gotta throw all the male children into the Nile River. He wants them all killed. So, I mean, it starts off, I mean, if after reading Genesis, you're like, oh, happy reunion, this is really great. And then all of a sudden, like, whoa. You know, it kind of almost reminds me of, you know, like Star Wars. <laughs> you know, when you watched you know, the, you know, the, the, the traditional ones and, you know, Darth Vader dies and Luke Skywalker is the victor. And then they came out with the new version and like, whoa, what happened? <laughs> you know, and I was, oh, there's this other dark force here now. And there's the power of evil. We read over and over again that there's these moments of mountain peak where there's victory over evil but it's never really fully achieved until Christ comes. And so this is one of those big valley moments at the beginning of, of Exodus. Sure. So we start off, like you said, this big valley, um, things do not look good as a people. What do you think their identity was at that point? I mean, 400 years, that's a long time mm. to go without formation, maybe some stories passed on and so forth. What do you think their, what do you think their understanding of their faith was at that point? I think what Exodus is revealing is that, yes, there's this big problem outside of the people of Israel with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, you know, that are killing them and enslaving them. Mm -hmm. But what Exodus is trying to show us more subtly is that there was a problem on the inside. Mm -hmm. I think this often happens, right? You know, that yeah. you look at our culture and we can say, well, why is our culture not Christian anymore? Well, it's because of Christians. <laughs> the Christians didn't shine the light we should have and been the salt of the world we should have. You're seeing a problem in Exodus, and Exodus will reveal this at different moments, that, that the people of Israel, after several generations of dwelling among the Egyptians, 
instead of evangelizing the Egyptians, what did they do? They ended up becoming like the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. They start worshiping the deities of the Egyptians. That becomes clear as the narrative unfolds. That's why they want to go out and you know, yeah. God says, you need to go out and sacrifice those animals that are associated with the worship of the Egyptians that you have fallen into. <laughs> you know, that's like the whole point of the Exodus story. You know, I think Scott Hahn was the one that famously said, um, you know, God wants to get you know, Israel out of Egypt so he can get Egypt out of Israel. Right. That right. Egyptian idolatry, Egyptian immorality and influence. Um, I remember, can I share a fun story? Yeah, this absolutely. Is like, so when I was in graduate school, um, I was doing my doctrine in Rome, and there's this great faithful professor that taught at the Gregorian. He had studied under someone named Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, yeah. so he was really good faithful. But he had not like, it wasn't so much like he knew the Bible timeline. Like, you know, he was probably one of these scholars that came of an age where there was suspicion and things. Even though he, he himself was a very faithful man, he didn't really know a lot about you know, more traditional ways of reading the scriptures, just the age in which he was raised. But he made an awesome point. And then he talks about how this line when it says in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, like so that Israel groaned under their bondage and cried out for help. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out that it's interesting that every time you have the same expression for cried out, you see this theme throughout the Old Testament where the people cry out to the Lord. Yeah. But here it doesn't say they cried out to the Lord. It just says that they cried out. Yeah. Like they didn't know who to cry out to. Yeah. So even though he, and I was like, oh, well, that's a reference to, because how the Israelites had fallen into, into Egyptian idolatry. He kind of looked at me going, I don't know if I heard that, but, you know, maybe he's just kind of, but I think that's a beautiful point that they didn't cry out to the Lord. They're, they're suffering. Their children are being thrown into the river. They're, they're enslaved. They're exhausted. They're being, you know, just so oppressed by Lack of by an Pharaoh. identity. Well, that's one of the points that I've noticed too is that the Exodus is not brought on by God just sort of arbitrarily. It is a response to this cry. Yeah. They are crying. We need, we need help. And the beautiful thing is God hears them. Even though they didn't cry specifically to him. Yeah. Because they were losing sense of who the one true God was. But God still heard their cry, remembering yeah. the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think there's a great practical point to our day because I look at, you know, my work again with so many young people on college campuses. So many young people are hurting. They're hurting so much, coming from broken homes. They're in addictions. They have so much anxiety and, and pressure. And they, they are hurting and they don't know, who, but they're crying out. Yeah. They don't know who to cry out to. Right. But they are crying and God hears their cry and he's going to come and rescue them like he did the Egyptians. Wow. Or, or I'm sorry, the Israelites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's good. So the, so the beginning of this really starts with the, there's the cry, but then this, this baby is rescued from the Nile. They were to throw the children into the Nile, mm -hmm. and this mother does it, but she throws them <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. into a boat, you <laughs> yeah. know, a little a little raft there, a little uh, ark. And who finds this little boy but Pharaoh's daughter? And he's named Moshe, you know, this drawing draw out. To, draw, to draw out. But then Moses, he, he lives the first 40 years, you know, in, uh, in Pharaoh's court. And then he sees someone abusing a fellow Hebrew. He takes action on it, kills him. He thinks, I got to get out of here now. And so he has 40 years out in the wilderness, almost like he's preparing the way for his, mm -hmm. his own people. But bring me to the burning bush point. This seems to be the point where God is saying, all right, in all, all seriousness here now, we're going to do something about this, mm -hmm. about this problem. What happens there? So the burning bush, this is the famous scene when God is calling Moses to go back to Egypt, which, by the way, this is a pretty scary thing. Yeah. And we often think, I remember as a kid hearing this story thinking, wouldn't it be cool if God spoke to me in a bush in my backyard? Yeah, right. <laughs> I really remember him talking. Thank and it you, wasn't Dad. consumed. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is really hard. He's saying, go back to Egypt where they were trying to kill you yeah. and go talk to that wicked dictator, Pharaoh, and try to convince him to let the people go. I don't think that was a job Moses was gunning for. <laughs> you yeah. know? So this is, this is really hard. And, and, and God you know, reveals his name, and Moses keeps make, coming up with every excuse. Like, I don't really know who you are. I, the people aren't going to believe me. I'm not a good leader. I'm not eloquent. And God, I love this because God doesn't come back to Moses and say, hey, you got this kid. You got talent. No, no. He says, basically, you know, yeah, you're pretty weak. You're pretty pathetic. But it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's not about you, Moses. And he reveals his name, I am, you know, the yeah. name Yahweh. And he, and he says many times in Exodus 3 and 4, 
I will be with you. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that I will be with you. No, that's you the beautiful truth yeah. there. And for people who are going through struggles in, in your own life, you know, as, uh, as you say, I don't have what it takes. I can't do this. I can't do that. No, but he's with you. Mm. And that's what, that's what really uh, counts there. Okay, so let's, let's look at, because we've got so much to talk <laughs> about here. Let's look at the Exodus in the Old Testament. We have 10 plagues. We've got a Passover lamb. They're leaving. And they're going to go down to Mount Sinai. Let's uh, put that into a, into a, you know, let's talk about that, you know, just, mm-hmm. just in that right there and what's, go, what's going on. Yeah. The big thing that God wants to do for Israel, again, is he does want to help them in their physical suffering that they're you know, enduring under Egypt, but he wants to free them more interiorly. Yeah. I think about like real freedom here. It's not just freedom from the slavery under Pharaoh, it's the slavery to sin and idolatry. So he wants them to go out to Mount Sinai and he's going to have them offer up these animals, which we read in Exodus 8, are, we've learned that these are abominations to the people of Egypt. You know, so when Pharaoh, when Pharaoh tries to say, okay, you keep wanting to leave to go offer your sacrifices, this three-day journey, and, you know, I don't think you're really going to come back here. I don't trust that, but I'll let you sacrifice here. So Pharaoh tries to negotiate with God, which is never a good idea. <laughs> he, he just got to do what God wants. And they tries to negotiate. I'll let you worship here. And Moses comes back in Exodus 8 and says, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, we'll be stoned to death if we offer these sacrifices here. And, and what that's a signal, it, it, it's, it's revealing to us is that the sacrifices God wanted Israel to make weren't just any kind of sacrifice. It was specifically offering up the very animals that were connected with the deities of Egypt, mm-hmm. which is why the Egyptians would view that as an abomination. And it would be like you know, killing the holy cow, the sacred cow, and sure. you can't do that. So that, that, that's giving us a window into the Exodus is so much more than just liberation from physical slavery. It's deeper. It's a liberation from a spiritual slavery, and God's asking them, "Hey, go sacrifice those very animals that you're that you're enslaved to, the the deities, the the cult worship that you're you're enslaved to. Sacrifice those to show, to prove I'm I'm really liberated. You know, like an alcoholic yeah. taking the the bottles of whiskey and just breaking them, saying I don't want this anymore. And right. that's I, I think animal sacrifice in this period is not just about a gift to God. It's also an expression of covenant loyalty, Mm -hmm. faith. I I like to say this animal sacrifice in the period of the Exodus is like a a ritual enactment of the first commandment. I shall not worship any other God except you, God. I'm not going to have any of these strange gods before you. Let me show you. I'm going to sacrifice these deities. Yeah. When... when, uh... When it didn't look like Pharaoh was going to cooperate here, we have almost this showdown, the showdown with all these plagues. Mm. And the, there's a number of plagues. Now, uh, people have said that, well, uh, those are just natural things that, that take <laughs> place. There's nothing supernatural about that. What do you say about that? And what is the purpose of those nine plagues? And then, of course, the death of the firstborn and the tenth plague. Yeah, I mean... I mean, I, I know in some parts of the Midwest, you might feel like you don't see the sun for three days, but you don't have total darkness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, like that, that's, that's a supernatural thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, or all of a sudden the river is turned to blood, you know, and they try to say, oh, it wasn't really blood. Well, no, the Bible says it was blood. You know, mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, that whole, the whole naturalistic explanations, clearly, you know, that, that's, not, that's not what's happening here. It, there really was a supernatural intervention, but it wasn't just like God wanting to punish the Egyptians. I mean, there's an element of that, but as I know you've taught many times, Jeff, that, that, that the language used over and over with all these plagues is Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, We're gonna do, God's going to do this so that you may know. Yeah. You may know the Lord. Yeah. And the whole story began with Pharaoh not knowing Joseph, and he says in Exodus 5, I don't, you know, who is this God? I don't know the Lord. You know, Pharaoh doesn't know the Lord, and, but the whole point of the plagues is there's a kind of a pedagogical purpose to them. It's to try to show, no, no, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the one true God, and all the deities of Egypt are not real deities at all. And that's why the plagues are, are strategic strikes against the Egyptian gods. They're not just random punishments. So, for example, you look at the River Nile turning to blood, and the River Nile was seen as like a deity. You know, so that was like, oh, wow, okay. And, you know, or you see, you know, they worship the cattle, and then you have the, the hail coming down, and they're, they're worried about their cattle being destroyed because they worship the cattle. You know, the firstborn son was also seen as uh, someone that would be like the, the heir to Pharaoh, who was also viewed as a deity. It, these all like, also striking against Pharaoh as a whole in the sense that it was believed that Pharaoh was the one that held the cosmos in order and kept everything in, in right harmony. And when you see absolute chaos with one plague after another after another, it's making clear to all the Egyptians 
you know, and hopefully it, would, it was intended to make clear to them and to, the, and to Pharaoh that, no, no, Yahweh is the one true God. I find it fascinating that in like the plague of the hail, like after all these plagues, suddenly the hail comes and even some of Pharaoh's own household goes, you know, Moses has been right all these times. I'm, I'm going home to get my, my cattle in shelter. <laughs> like in other words, they believe. And, and yeah. we get this sense that right later in the, in the, that there's a mixed multitude of people that leave with the, with the Israelites. So there were some Egyptians that went through a certain kind of conversion mm-hmm. uh, even. So it shows that God was against the Egyptians. He's against sin in all of our hearts, whether it's Egyptian, <laughs> Israel, or, or American, whatever, you know, like he's, he's against sin in all of our hearts and he wants to liberate us from that. And that's, that's what the Exodus is going after. So we have the eighth plague, the locusts. We have the ninth plague, darkness. And, and then in chapter 11, we have a big, big warning about the final plague, yet one, one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh. And of course, that's the death of the firstborn. And then in chapter 12, he says, uh, I want you to take a lamb mm-hmm. on the 10th day of this first month of Nisan and inspect it until the 14th. And then at twilight, I want you to sacrifice it. I want you to, to put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel of your, of your home. And I want you to prepare. Let's talk a little bit about that. What is God doing? Why a lamb? Why the blood? Uh, why this, this, this preparation? Gird your loins, you know, and um, the bread and all of it. The unleavened bread yeah. being in haste, right? Because they didn't have time for that that bread to rise because yeah. maybe let's let's understand why they're going in haste maybe okay so i i think to get into the passover here what, what's been the goal of the whole exodus story so far it's been we want god wants the people to go out into the desert sacrifice the animals associated with egyptian idolatry to prove their their loyalty to god rejection of idolatry and pharaoh keeps saying no 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 you can't do it no and then finally in this last plague I, while there's a lot that everyone thinks about, like the punishment on Egypt here, there's also a trial, I think, for the Israelites. Because the Israelites have, if, if there's any Israelite having half a heart and they think that killing a lamb would be a bad thing or that this is, you know, this is going to be, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe the lamb has, has, has some magical powers or his supernatural powers. If anyone's like compromised, as many of them had been, right, that we've been talking about, to go and actually sacrifice that animal, once again, is like, a sign of fidelity to God. So I reject idolatry. I'm going to sacrifice this animal. And then God doesn't just say, okay, then you're, you're done. You do a nice little private prayer. <laughs> you know, God says, no, I'll go take the blood and put it on the doorposts. And that's like publicly telling all the Egyptians, yep, we were the ones that sacrificed. And what, and what do we see back in Exodus 8? That if you sacrifice these animals in the land, what were the Egyptians going to do to them? Yeah. They're going to stone them. So when you put that blood on the doorpost, this isn't kind of like, you know, if you ever see a Catholic at a restaurant going, well, should I pray? Oh I'm nervous. No, this is like, hey, everybody, I'm a Christian. You know, yeah. In this case, I sacrificed that lamb. Yeah. No wonder they're eating in haste because they got to get out of there because they will be killed. And blood mm-hmm. on wood does not clean up well. No. <laughs> <laughs> so there's going to be a little uh, uh, memory here. Of the, this, is, this is one of the families, you know, in this house. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is, I mean, this story, again, I think we t- people, when they read it, they tend to focus on, okay, this is punishment on Egypt. But it was a, it was a test of faith for the Israelites mm-hmm. to prove, I, all right, I, I am not going to be on, my, on the fence anymore with my faith, worshiping Yahweh and these other deities. Yeah. By this action, I worship you alone. Again, it's like a ritual enactment of the first commandment. Isn't that kind of an example of condes- condescension, mm-hmm. of God coming down to their level and saying, look, you... I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you so that you don't want to turn back. You yeah. know, I'm Father, mm-hmm. and I'm going to I'm going to help you in this. It's like burning your bridge. Yeah, really. Yeah, no, I, I think that that is exactly what happens that day. And you get you kind of get a sense that not not every Israelite even went through with this ritual. Mm-hmm. You know that there were some of them that wavered. You know, but you get this mixed multitude Israelites and others that go out with them, and and this is the day of their liberation. This is when they're founded as you know, their nation, and they're free, finally, yeah. and they're on their way, beginning their journey. You can imagine being, being one of the people and hearing this. There, there had to have been, like you said, there had to have been a bit of fear, too, of we're doing what? You know, how is this going to happen? Who's leading us? <laughs> and, and there was probably some excitement to it. 
And lo and behold, the day came and there was a great cry Mm -hmm. in the land Mm -hmm. and the firstborn died. Mm -hmm. That had to have been a shock to the, to the entire culture. Oh, so we wake up every day. I mean, we think about like, you know, the Marvel movies or something when all of a sudden, you know, one person just goes like this and then it's a blip and everybody's gone. Like, I mean, it was, it was that kind of dramatic. Now it wasn't as like half of all humanity, but all the firstborn in every family's household Mm -hmm. to hear that cry would have been shocking, not just for the Egyptians, but also even for the Israelites hearing their fellow Egypt, you know, the people in the land crying in this act. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's amazing. Okay, so let's go a little bit further on. We, we, we end up leaving. We're leaving Egypt. Why do we call it the Passover? Let's, let's talk about that real briefly. Why do we call it Passover? Yeah, the, the angel of the, of, of the Lord mm-hmm. passing over the houses of the Israelites that, that had you know, gone through the ritual of showing faithfulness to God. They were protected sure. from that, that plague of the first... Uh, now, that firstborn in every family had to have felt... A little special, <laughs> you, you know. It's like that, uh, would, <laughs> that would have been me, you know, if uh, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for the Lord. Was the firstborn treated differently after that in Israel? Oh yeah, yeah. First of all, just put yourself existentially. If I was a first, well, I am a, actually a firstborn. So if I was You're in Egypt, too. oh my goodness, I'd be like, Dad, did you follow the rule? Or what yeah, right. You, said? you really follow that. <laughs> Thank God, Dad is religious. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm glad he's not just spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> he's just <Right>. religious. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. So the firstborn was, was back in ancient. I mean, let me go back to Genesis a little bit to paint a picture. Mm-hmm. You know, it, we know that in every father in the home was like a priest. You know, they were the ones. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are offering sacrifices and leading the the family, the tribe, in, in worship of God. And you see that here, right? It's going to be every father in the home that's going to be celebrating this ritual. They're, they're not going to the temple. They're not going to the Levitical priesthood. There is no temple or Levitical priesthood now. Every father in the home is in this role. Mm-hmm. And so the firstborn are, are consecrated to God. They're set apart. But what's going to happen as we move forward in the story is that the, the firstborn are going to be even... Uh, they were the ones that were supposed to assume that role of... of of being the priest, mm-hmm. as had been done in the patriarchal period in Genesis, but they're going to lose that when you get to the golden calf, which I think is the next session that you'll, you'll yeah, explore. Yeah, Exodus 32. Yeah, because they weren't faithful that day, as the Levites were the only ones that were faithful. And so you'll see that the the firstborn and the father in the home will lose that, that role of being the role of the priest. Okay, so they have been doing this now. Every year they've been celebrating the Passover. Uh, even in the wilderness there, it seemed like there was some points where they weren't, and then they, they resumed, you know, when they came into Gilgal, when they came into the land under Joshua, and they started to resume the Passover. But it was one of the, the three uh, major feasts yep. for them every single year where they went, to, they went to Jerusalem. And then we come to the time of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And let's look at how Jesus saw the Passover, how he entered into the Passover, and what he taught his disciples about the mm-hmm. Passover and his life. Yeah, you know, Jesus would have grown up with this. In fact, we read about that in Luke mm-hmm. chapter 2, in that famous story of him being lost and found in the temple. It tells us that he went up, you know, their family went up regularly, yeah. and, and which was, you know, that was common, but even Mary went. And that wasn't common that the woman would always go, you know, and she came every year and they would go. So he grew up celebrating the Passover. Um, and, and then you see in his, his public ministry, there's like three Passovers we read about in John's gospel. Uh, the wedding of Cana comes right before one of those Passovers, uh, the beginning of his public ministry. Then he gives the famous bread of life discourse. Uh, mm-hmm. and multiplication of loaves comes in John chapter 6. That's a second Passover. Uh, and then you get the third one, which comes, of course, uh, when he institutes the Eucharist at the Last Supper and his own passion and death. But I think, you know, if you think of Cana, you got this, you know, great offering of, a, of you know, 120 gallons of wine, water changed into wine. The imagery of, of the wine, and then the second Passover, the imagery of the bread, the multiplication of the loaves, feeding five thousand people, the wine and the bread, foreshadowing the the you know the the ultimate Passover that yeah. Jesus Himself endures. So this is this is all part of of Jesus's intentional public ministry. He grew up with it, he knew it, but he's also using some of the imagery of the Passover 
to make points in his ministry itself. So by the time we come to the New Testament, they're doing what they always did. They're, they're sacrificing a lamb. These in Shepherd's yep. Field in Bethlehem, they're raising these, these sheep and the, these lambs, and then they bring them in. In the Old Testament in, in Egypt, this wasn't, uh, what am I trying to say? This wasn't just uh, something that we did as a memory. They actually did it. It wasn't like lamb cookies or oh, something yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah. They actually did it. Yeah. And in the New Testament, did they actually do it or did they move to cookies at that point or well, it something. It wasn't cookies, of... but they had lamb-shaped matzo. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay, yeah. Let's talk about the ritual itself maybe. Like, yeah. so every year, the Jews continue on that same 14th day of Nisan to, to celebrate the Passover. And I would like to break it down really simply that every year, they did a couple things. Themselves. First of all, the father in the home would retell the story. It was always important to retell the story of that first Passover. Mm -hmm. That's a part of the, the Seder meal ritual. But it wasn't just a retelling. There was also a reenactment. I like to say, like, like they were doing like a skit every year to, to yeah. remember what they did. So what do they do? You get a lamb, have it sacrificed in the temple, uh, and then you ate of the lamb. You ate of the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread. They're just reenacting it. So they retell the first the story of the founding of their nation. They reenact it, but then most of all, and this is the third key thing, they celebrated it as a memorial. And this is that idea of, uh, in the New Testament, like, of, of memorial, when Jesus says, do this in memory, memory of me, it's anamnesis, relating to the Hebrew word ziggurat, which yeah. is not just remembering, not just bringing to mind, but making present. Right, right. It makes the past event That's present. such an important point, you know, that like um, that idea of zakar, you know, in Hebrew, the ziggurat, uh, how do we remember? We enter into the meal. Mm -hmm. we, we don't just sit back and go, hmm. Good memories. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they set the table. Mm -hmm. That's how you remember you set the table. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're actually eating of a, of a lamb. And then Jesus says, you know, do this in memorial of me. So it's, making, it's a making present. So the idea is that every time they went through this ritual each year, they believed that like that original Passover event from Exodus 12 was mystically made present to them so they could participate in it. Mm -hmm. There's some rabbis about a generation after Jesus that are, that are writing about this saying, hey, when we celebrate the Passover, it's as if we are walking out of Egypt. Yep. Like, so we're at one with our ancestors, with Moses and Aaron and Adam and Abihu, like it, it's a past event. And we don't, we don't think this way in our modern Western culture. You know, we, we might have Memorial Day in the United States, we remember those who've mm -hmm. gone before us, but it is just a remembrance. But if we celebrated our, our holidays in the United States like a biblical memorial, say like 4th of July, you know what we would do? We would retell the story of the Declaration of Independence, but we wouldn't just retell it, we'd reenact it. We might like do a solemn reading and you'd come up and put your name on there, I put my name on there, and, it, and but then we weren't just reenacting and retelling, we would be doing it as a memorial, meaning we would believe that the past was made present, that Thomas Jefferson is right here with us mm -hmm. mystically and John Adams and John Hancock and, and like we're at one with our ancestors. And, and so this, was an, this is what, how the Jews viewed all of their feasts in the sense of a yeah. memorial, not just recalling, but actually a making present so that you can participate in it. Yeah. And I love what the son says to the father in the, in the traditional uh, Pesach, you know, the, the, the Passover. Uh, father, what is different about Yes. This night from all other nights. Yes. Uh, yeah. This night is different, mm -hmm. something different. And then we, we move into really the, the heart of it, the Last Supper. And, and the Last Supper, uh, let's talk about that. They come up together and they are going to celebrate the Passover, but this is going to be different than any other Passover that has ever been celebrated in the history of the world. Yeah. So if you, I always like to just say, let's just go back in a time machine and imagine being one of those apostles there. I mean, you, as a Jew, you would have grown up celebrating the Passover, but this one was a very different Passover. And uh, they go in and there's a lot of hope around, you know, Jesus just came into the city, mm -hmm. riding on the donkey, the people claim him as king. Clean the temple. Yeah, they clean the temple. There's <laughs> all this great hope about Jesus because there was hope that one day in a future Passover, the king would come, the Messiah would come. There's a great poem, the poem of the four nights that said like the creation of the world happened on the 14th day of nights and it was the climax of creation. And that the offering of, of, of Abraham, Abraham offering up Isaac in Genesis 22 happened on that day. And, and the original Passover happened on that day. But the fourth night, the fourth Passover to come, that, that, that 14th day of Nisan, the calendar. Uh, this poetic explanation does speak to the expectations of 
the people in the first century Jewish world that the Messiah was going to come to Jerusalem and establish the kingdom on a Passover. So you can imagine, you're Philip, you're James, yeah. you're there at the Passover. This, this is not just Passover. This is the Passover. You're all excited. Then you walk in. And at least according to the biblical accounts, it's fascinating. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us you know, an account of the Last Supper. They don't mention the main dish. Mm-hmm. You'd expect there right, to, to be the lamb, right? If you talk about Thanksgiving, you talk about a turkey, right? You expect there to be a lamb. There's no mention of that. Paul doesn't mention it either when he writes about it in First Corinthians. And so you could be going, what, what's going on? But when you read what Jesus actually says, there is a lamb there. Because he says, this is my body being offered up for you, which is technical language taken from the New Testament and, the ten, and pointing to the temple system where the animal would be offered up in sacrifice, the, the yeah. lamb. Um, and he says, this is by blood, which is being poured out for forgiveness of sins. Again, that's technical language describing how the blood of the animal will be poured out over the altar for forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. Jesus takes that temple sacrificial language and applies it to himself. Now, the apostles at that point, mm-hmm. sitting there around this triclinium with him, you know, eating, yeah. they're, they're probably not going... Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, that Theologically, that sound, you know. <laughs> they're probably thinking, what? what you're, you're the Passover lamb? <laughs> exactly. You know, because along the way, not everything was completely clear to them. Mm. But this must have been, this must have jarred them a bit, I would think. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, t- he's talking about, first of all, he had been alluding to his death, right? And yeah. all the way on the journey to Jerusalem, he's alluding to it, and they, and they just don't get it. They're just confused. He doesn't get it. This would be, I think, one of the clearest moments. Like, my body's going to be offered up. My blood is about to be poured out. Mm-hmm. And just, I mean, just imagine if, like, you know, we're catching up over coffee, and they say, hey, Jeff, my, my blood's about to be poured out. You'd be like, should I call 911? Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, you know, right. You know, and, and but so this would be really, yes, jarring, surprising. And I think they're just trying to, like, but they've heard Jesus say jarring things like eat my flesh and drink my blood before. So they're, they're used to him saying things and not understanding too. So while it's shocking, they're, they're hanging in there with him, you know, and then they'll say things like, oh, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll go to prison with you. I'll, I'll even die with you, you know, Peter says <laughs> that night, you know, and, and so they're, they're, they're wanting to like stay close to him. They get a sense some big trials about to fall, unfold in their lives and his life and but I don't think they, I think it's still veiled. I think it's still cloudy for them. Mm-hmm. We can look back in faith and see, oh, we know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That, the, you know, when they're, when they're sitting there in the upper room uh, and they would normally say, uh, you know, what's different about this night than any other night? And they would think back to, to Egypt. I would think that the disciples sitting around <laughs> with him are not doing a whole lot of thinking back, but they're trying. Right to, now. Right now. <laughs> yeah. Something historic is happening and Passover will never be the same ever again. And in the Old Testament, Passover was all about freedom and transformation. Mm-hmm. So is Jesus still talking about freedom and transformation with yeah. himself as the Passover lamb? Yeah. And the real freedom here is as the roots and what we talked about earlier is like the real spiritual freedom. Yeah. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's liberating us from the devil, the captivity of the enemy. He's liberating us from sin. He's liberating us from death. He, is he offers up his body and blood like a Passover lamb. He is the new Passover lamb. Mm-hmm. He's doing that to spare not just all the firstborn, yeah. but all humanity. We're going to be saved right. through this. And that's why he says, do this in memorial of me. You know, So in other words, make this new sacrifice present so that people of all ages, all around the world, to the end of time, can enter into this and, and receive the gift of salvation and freedom from yeah. sin, death. Okay, so now we come to a major shift and this is where we are different. And the church historically has been different. And I'm thinking about the Reformation mm-hmm. on it was different than historically, how the church saw that, that, uh, that Passover. When Jesus talks about, do this in memory of me, we're either going to go forward with the church celebrating the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus, or we're going to get them in a room thinking back to this event and thinking, yeah, that was really wonderful, and I'm appropriating the graces of what happened back there. What does the church understand about this going forward that has become part of the very fabric of our, of our faith? Okay, uh, a couple things that, that emerge from this. First of all, I think, you, you know, when you think about the Eucharist, there's many different angles of it. 
we think about, you know, I think where Catholics tend to go to right away is, oh, the real presence, you know, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and that, and you, we get that here. He's saying, this is my body, this is my blood. But I, I, I like putting this uh, doctrine of the real presence, not just in the words, this is, which is really essential, but also just look back at the Passover. And that, that's the pattern, right? What did you do when you were in Egypt? You had to take a lamb, have it sacrificed, and then you had to eat the lamb. Yes. All right, if, if I was a father in the home and I didn't eat the lamb, yeah, well, I, just, well, I just don't like lamb taste. <laughs> I'm just a little full today. My firstborn son is dead that next morning. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't eat the lamb. Because, and, and even, let's go back even further behind the Passover. All of these rituals, all the, the sacrifices, almost all of them have, you offer up the animal and sacrifice as a sign of a gift to God. And then you, you partake of the lamb or the whatever animal was sacrificed. There's the communion meal because the communion meal symbolizes covenant union. The idea is that like, you and I could be enemies in the book of Genesis, but we make a peace treaty and then we'll have a meal and we offer up the sacrifice to God we, and we eat the same food. The same food going into you is going into me and it symbolizes a shared life. Mm-hmm. We're like brothers now. Right. We're enemies before we're brothers. Well, this is just the pattern. And so when you get to the Passover, the same thing. You have the sacrifice of the animal and you have to eat the lamb. You don't just remember the lamb. You don't eat a lamb-shaped cookie or lamb-shaped matzah. You know, you, you have to eat the lamb. So if Jesus is the new Passover lamb and he's offering his body and blood on the cross, the cross isn't the final thing. It's the most important thing, mm-hmm. but we have to eat the lamb. Okay. We have to partake of his body and blood. What you're saying there is so important for people to get because we look at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Yay, he died for, he died for our sins. But there has to be a covenant meal. Yes. We have to share in that covenant meal. We don't share in a, in a covenant remembering. Yes. We share in a meal. So how can we yeah. possibly share in that meal if yeah. it happened 2,000 years ago? Through the Eucharist. But I want to drive that point home you just said. Okay. It's so important. Like, like back in, in Egypt, no one just said, hey, we sacrificed the animal. Yeah. We're good. No, 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 no. You have to eat of the lamb. Like that is, that's essential. So again, if, you're, if we approach what Jesus does on, his cro- on the cross with a truly biblical lens, we should all be going, well, of course, there should be a meal. Yeah. And what does St. Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 7? Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, therefore we're saved. No. He says, okay, he's been sacrificed, therefore we have to f- celebrate the feast. Exactly. And what's the feast in 1 Corinthians? It's the communion of the body and blood. It's the Eucharist. You know, so it's through the participation in the Eucharist that then we get to receive the very body and blood. So it's not just a reminder. It's not just a symbol of Jesus. It is his actual body and blood that we partake of. And that's the communion meal that unites us with Christ and we receive the graces of Have believers throughout history from that point on, have believers universally taught this and believed this, that... Up until the 1500s. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in that early church, in the first 1500 years or so, this was not really a disputed thing, was it? No, there's no one going around saying, oh, we just have, we're just remembering Jesus, or it's mm-hmm. just a symbol. No, they all know that we're, we're partaking. What would you say to someone who, who didn't know that, that didn't know that, and that they just assumed that this was something that we remember? Well, I'd, I'd, I, okay, so in like a conversation, this is a friend, and I'm, they're, they're, I'm sure. sharing some of this. I'd want to be pastorally very sensitive and just say, hey, look, you know, it doesn't mean everything you've believed is all off. Like there's many good things in your Protestant tradition, for example. Right. You really did want to remember Jesus in the best way that, that you were given. And, and God looks very favorably upon that. He loves you and sees your heart that you were desiring to worship. I want to like start there. Sure. But, you know, nevertheless, but moving forward, <laughs> moving yeah. forward, Jesus has something even more in store for you. Because it's good that you remembered. But he wants to bring you into the biblical memorial, the sacrifice of, mm-hmm. of, of the Eucharist, and receive him in Holy Communion. For those that are not familiar with a sacrament, we're not, when we say, well, now that body and blood, soul and divinity, and this covenant meal is real today, and we are, resp- we are entering into that meal, the sacrifice of the Lamb on Calvary, uh, but we're doing it sacramentally. Well, that's a big word. We're doing it sacramentally, which for some people is is tantamount to it's kind of magic, you know. It's just mm. you just believe it, you know. What do we mean by a sacrament, mm. and how does a sacrament make that meal 
as real to us today as it did to them 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I mean, sacrament in general, you get like the basic old catechism definition that's the new catechism kind of embodies as well, is it's an outward sign instituted by Christ to confer grace. So it, like God, all throughout salvation history, and you see Jesus doing this, using natural things, symbols, signs that point to what he's really doing supernaturally. So I would like to say, if you want to, like, if you could see with the eyes of angels what's really going on, uh, it would be amazing, but we can't. So God uses things like bread and wine and oil and water, you know, baptism and other sacraments to, to convey like what's really happening supernaturally in the soul. So mm -hmm. we go, th you know, through the ritual of baptism and there's water and, you know, then the, you, you get a white garment, you know, and then you get a candle. Like, okay, does God really <laughs> need to use those things? No, God doesn't need to. God's all powerful, but we need that because we can't see supernaturally. So it wakes us up to go, oh, wow, there's been a cleansing of this person's soul. There's been a, a, the light of the world is dwelling within their soul now. They're white. They're made clean. That's why they're the white garment. You know, so I think that's, why, that's the idea of a sacrament. But maybe, Jeff, I think get, getting at like, the, the Eucharist and, and the sacrifice mm -hmm. and how we enter into it, this, this is really on my heart. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think a lot of Catholics know that there's a crisis in catechesis on the real presence, that you know, two-thirds of Catholics in America don't believe that the Eucharist is really the body, blood, soul, and divinity. They think it's just a reminder, a symbol of Jesus. And that's a crisis. But I think there's an even greater crisis, mm. a crisis with the sacrifice of the Mass. You know, in, in, in March of 2020, when the pandemic breaks out and churches are closed, in March, April, May, and much of 2020, I heard so many Catholics around the world say, I miss receiving Holy Communion. Oh, I miss this. I want to receive, and that was beautiful. And we all learned about spiritual communion that year. And, mm -hmm. But I never heard a single Catholic ever say, I miss the sacrifice of the Mass. Mm. Mm. Never heard a single one. I think that tells us something, you know, that a lot of us don't really know. Maybe we've heard that expression, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I remember as a kid at Catholic grade school, the holy sacrifice of the Mass will be at 830. What is that all about? We don't really know what it is. This is, this is actually the, the, the primary aspect of the Eucharist is our participation in that sacrifice. And so uh, how, how are we participating in that? It goes back to the idea of biblical memorial. When Jesus says, do this in memory of me, what's he saying? Do this. What's this? The offering of my body and the, uh, and the pouring out of my blood. In other words, the, what, what he, what's going to happen on the cross? Make that present for all ages to come. And so every time we go to Mass, the Catechism says it's a representation, not a representation, not a symbol, but a representation, a making present of that first sacrifice, just like the ancient Passover brought the original Passover mystically present. So when we, I like to say when we go to Mass, it's like we go to Calvary. We're there with St. John and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Calvary is made present to us. Why? So that we can be transformed. And here, here's, here's the real key, I think. And, I, and again, a lot of Catholics don't make this connection, but it's so important we get this right, is that um, yeah, I always like to say, you know, when you look at the cross, you see perfect love. The God who is love becomes man, becomes one of us, shows us love. But uh, JP2 said the fullest revelation of God's love is on the cross. And when I look at that cross, I see that perfect love. And, I, and, and that cross is what we're called to. It's not like Jesus died instead of us. He died and rose and gave us the spirit so that we could mm. do that. Yeah. In my marriage, I need to sacrifice and love like Jesus and be patient with my kids, with my friends and my colleague and with my God most of all. And I don't know about you, but I know I fall short a lot in, in, mm -hmm. in that total sacrificial love, and we all do. So if I want to, if I have areas in my life where I know I can be more patient like Jesus was on Good Friday or generous or sacrificial, how do I grow in that? I pray, I read the Bible. And, but the number one place if I want to grow in sacrificial love is the sacrifice of the Mass. Yeah. yeah. And so at those words of consecration, whenever we go to Mass, we hear, this is my body, this is my blood. That was, this is like the supreme moment. This is not time to look around and see who's there or develop your parking lot exit strategy. You know, no, this is time to say, Jesus, I love you. I want to unite my life with you. I thank you. You know, I, I, I give myself to you here. Because that's what Catechism 1368 tells us, that at every Mass, we're supposed to unite all of our works, all of our joys, all of our sufferings mm -hmm. with Christ's offering of himself so that he can relive what he did on Calvary. He can live through us that we may live that perfect love. That is so beautiful, you know, and it reminds me of, it reminds me of two things that Paul said, you know, and to the Galatians he said, I have been crucified mm. with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who, who lives. lives in me. That in the mass, it screams that, mm. that you're here, you're with me 
in this. You are tasting love. You are coming into contact with love. And that's what John Paul II said. He said, uh, you know, uh, Paul says over in Colossians 1.24, he said, I rejoice in my suffering for your mm-hmm. sake. And I fill up in my body that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And they asked uh, Pope John Paul, what does that mean? Does it mean he didn't, he missed something? He said, no, no, but that you might come to know the love of God. He's made room for you Mm -hmm. to participate in that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that's how we come into that incredible intimacy Mm -hmm. with God. So as we're talking, I'm even seeing more and more in my life that this goes way beyond a simple memory. Mm. This is active. That maybe that's what it means to be more actively involved, <laughs> you know, in the mass. Yeah, I think that line from Galatians you you mentioned there. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's true by virtue of our baptism. We have that like mm-hmm. Christ dwelling within us. But we want that to grow, yeah. and we do that by frequently frequenting the sacraments and the principal sacraments we we are frequenting is it's the mass and it's this offering so i, I think real presence is, is super important holy communion of course right that's like where it reaches its climax but i, I what struck me back going back to 2020 is when I, when i hear everybody talk about i miss receiving i think what we're looking at is like what what do i get out of mass? you're not sure yeah what do i get as opposed to no i i, I will get more if i come to give yeah and we haven't done the catechesis in our homes and our parishes on this aspect of the liturgy because it's not about like what I get primarily. It's Jesus is there and he mm-hmm. wants me to unite myself with him to the Father. Yeah. That is beautiful. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to get to know you a little bit more and your, your work in, in the Bible. And we also have some questions from our, our viewers. So we'll be right back in just a moment. <music> Many of us have heard these stories about Jesus' passion. We've heard about him agonizing in a garden, being scourged and being nailed to a cross. But do we understand their full significance? What if we were Jews in the first century and we were encountering these stories for the very first time? What would those stories mean to us? I want us to enter in on the inside to all that was happening in Jesus so that we can understand what this all means for our lives today. We're going to walk step by step with Jesus on his journey from Gethsemane to Calvary. And along the way, we're going to see the various places where these events took place, whether it be the stone upon which he agonized in the garden, or Caiaphas's house where he faced his trial, or the stone on Calvary upon which stood the cross where Jesus died. We will encounter a love that the world has never known. Indeed, Jesus himself said, There is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Welcome back to the Bible Timeline Show. Our guest this week is Dr. Edward Sree. What a great conversation. Um, I hope I so fast. Oh, (laughs) man. Okay, I want to know a little bit about, you've got a a fairly well-worn Bible here. Mm. Uh, Fairly. (laughs) Uh, I want to know a little bit about your life in the Bible, because you have spent the majority of your life studying the Bible. And like you said earlier, you're you're Dr. Edward Sree, you've taught at the university, you you teach with focus. What's your daily? What's your daily routine? What what do you do? Yeah, so when you talk about this Bible here, this is the Bible that, you know, when I was in graduate school, I wanted to get a good translation, and at the time, there weren't many options. This one came, a friend of mine from Trinidad had an extra version of this, and it, it comes from England, and it was the Revised Standard Catholic Edition, and, you know, so the same, like, you know, like the the Ascension Bible is based on this, and but at the time, this was it, and I got all my markings in here from graduate school and many years of teaching. Like, if I lose this thing, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have a panic attack, you know, because <laughs> I got so many notes in here. But I have to tell you, Jeff, when you talk about like my, when you say my daily time with scripture. So when I'm teaching, I'm preparing a class, mm-hmm. I'm going to this. This is the version I go to. Okay. This is what you'll see me, you know, I'm at a conference, I'm quoting scripture, I'm, I'm usually pulling out this because this is the muscle memory I'm familiar with. <laughs> yeah. But when I'm just wanting to pray with scripture, I used to pray with this one, but I, I find 
I can't anymore mm-hmm. as much. I mean, I, I can, but I get distracted. I get distracted. Okay, oh, that highlighted there. Oh, there's this this little note in Greek that I wrote, or I mentioned this little Bible reference. I, I, I this is like my teaching Bible. Sure. And for me, at least, I find this one's. But you know, if I went to find a pray with Jesus, I got the I got this other Bible that's more clean. I mean, I do. I'll, I will underline things, but it's not as intense as as this one is. And and I just find I'm able to just be with the Lord more. And I'll be honest, the, the way I pray with Scripture is is very different from when I'm studying and teaching. Like I actually love using Magnificat. That is my favorite. I love the reflections in Magnificat. I love the little the way they design the the little morning prayers that, that come with Scripture. But I like to pray with the the Mass reading, particularly the Gospel. And I like it like taken out of the narrative, it, it, which is counterintuitive because like you and I like we know we always want to bring everything into the narrative. Right. But for me, because of my teaching background, my mind goes to teaching and I don't want that. So if I just like, I'm reading this thing and I'm just encountering it, this passage and Jesus and he's there with the leper and and I'm just able to enter into it, Mm -hmm. I think without teaching mode, I'm able to pray with it more. You yeah, can do it, but it's harder. <laughs> yeah, is, there, is there one verse where if, you know, somebody said, well, what do, you, do you have a life verse? Is there one that always is feeding you? What would it be? Oh, can I give a few here for different angles? I, I'm going to have to check with the producer, but no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Luke 2.19 is a verse that I always, it's, it's I, I've used many different verses when people ask me to sign a book. That's probably one I, sign, I use the most. It's Mary kept all these things and pondered them okay. in her heart. And I like to just think of that, the interior life of Mary, that whether it's mysterious events unfolding in her life, suffering, or the word of God, she's always keeping it and talking to God about, Lord, what does this mean? Mm-hmm. Why did this happen? Uh, and so I, I like to have that always in mind. So, But in terms of like some life verses maybe more, mm-hmm. I would turn to Romans 8, 28 is a really big one. You know, in all things, God works for good in those who love him. And to just remember that no matter what's happening in my life, you know, I'm worried about something or I'm going through a hardship or I'm worried about what may happen in the future. To just put that before my mind is just a great verse. It says, you know, in all things, God's going to work for good. Mm -hmm. So I, I might be able to control this thing happening right here, or what someone thinks of me, or you know what's going to happen with one of my kids, or is this thing project going to work out? Like, those, like in the end, to have that inner peace and confidence, the Lord, that in all things, no matter what's happening now, or what might happen in the future, God's going to use it for my. Yeah, career. and because you buried that in your heart, it can speak to you at different times. Yeah, you know, and that's the value of memorizing and putting the Word of God into your heart is that it nurtures you and feeds you and comforts mm-hmm. you and directs you in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's a big one I turn to. And then 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 9 to 10, the whole part about St. Paul and that, you know, your strength is made manifest in, yeah. in my weakness. weakness. Like that, that's a, a, I like that because it reminds me of St. Therese, who's my favorite saint, and her spirituality in a little way, that it's not about our performance and relying on ourselves. It's actually precisely in those areas of weakness we learn to rely yeah. on God. That's when we are, are, are held together and, and transformed and lifted to spiritual heights. Ready for some questions? Oh, yeah. Let's so we go. got some questions. Okay, so Bob, do the plagues have specific meaning or were these plagues just sort of random, random? Yeah, okay. is this just like, like a father in the home just angry? And he's so he's just like <laughs> frustrated with his children. So he breaks this toy and breaks this dish. And you know, no, that's Messes not what's happening. Up the river. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's what happened here. Like, if really, all the, and we kind of touched on some of this. I had mentioned that. Um, it, there's a great line in Exodus 12:12 12, 12 that says, you know, that these that God is going to bring, you know, judgment upon the Egyptian gods. That's what these plagues are. They're they are all strategic strikes against the various deities uh, of Egypt. And just to remind us, some of them I had mentioned that the, the River Nile was, was a god. You know, certainly the River Nile is like providing all this water for the Egyptian Delta there, but it was viewed as actually a deity. So for that to turn to blood, I mean, that's like. Death stops the economy. No, stops the economy too. Yeah, yeah. There is that, but it is. But it's symbolizing the death of that. Yeah. of that deity. Um, I had mentioned, you know, that they worshipped the cattle, and and the, so for the hail coming down, they're worried about the cattle being damaged and hurt. Worship the sun. They worship the sun. So you got the the ray god, and then so yeah, all of a sudden the sun turned to darkness. You know, so yeah. all of these all of these interventions from it's called god. ray ban. <laughs> Just Were they, did they sing well too? <laughs> Ray Ban sunglasses. 
Yeah, so all, all of these are, are connected. And they're strategic strikes against mm -hmm. the particular deities of Egypt. Good. One more question. Luke. Luke has a good question. Luke wants to know if the Last Supper was so powerful, why didn't Jesus just rely on the Last Supper? Why did he have to actually go and die on a cross? Mm. Yeah, so I, th I think this is probably going back to what we were looking at earlier, that when Jesus is at the Last Supper, he's offering up his body and blood. That's what he says. This is my body being offered up. This is my blood being poured out. Like, do this in memory of me. Isn't, right. Are we all done? Seems like that would be good enough. We're yeah. all good. Yeah, yeah. Why do we need the bloody sacrifice the next day on Calvary? Well, I think what we want to see is that it's a continuum. What Jesus begins at the Last Supper is carried out externally in his body the next day. So what happens at the Last Supper is it's an, he, this is the beginning of the sacrifice. He is, in fact, it's, I think in the, in the Greek it actually says you know, that Jesus' blood is being poured out. So it's like he is already like interiorly in the act of his will offering up his body and blood. And, and then later that same night he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he, you know, says, Father, not my will, may your will be done. And so he is offering up his body, but in his words now, he's even committing himself to this. And now the next day is all carried out in, in his crucifixion, actually. So we want to see that as a whole continuum. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, he, so he had to die. So the climax of this interior sacrifice that begins at the Last Supper is, is his death on, on Good Friday on Calvary. And it's that whole passion and sac sacrifice of Jesus that is made present. That's what Jesus, when he says, do this in memorial of me, saying, make this sacrifice, this offering of my body and blood that I'm beginning now, that I'll reaffirm in Gethsemane, and that I'm going to you know, have carried out my body the next day. Make this present at every liturgy, at every Eucharist mm -hmm. for ages to come. So that we can be changed by that and live yeah. that total perfect. It's kind of a full circle, isn't it? You, you go from the, from the Last Supper to the cross, and then the resurrection. And then after that, Luke 24, you know, you have mm. Cleopas and, and, and uh, uh, someone else walking and Jesus comes up to them and he begins to teach mm -hmm. them. But it's in the breaking of the bread that their eyes are, are opened yeah. and you see the graces flowing there, you know, with uh, uh, that Emmaus Road experience. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's well, that's our experience, right? Yeah, it, that our, may our eyes be open every time we go to the liturgy, so that then maybe that next step of that sacrifice that Jesus began last supper reaffirms that the Gethsemane carried out in His body the next day, may it be lived in us mm -hmm. every, every mass, so that His perfect love is transforming our very imperfect hearts. Praise God that we have those three major things that were so a part of the Passover. We have the Word of God, we have the manna, we have Jesus as the great high priest, and uh, he has given us everything that we need to live a, a godly life and a holy life. Mm -hmm. And we just need to share it with more people and live it. I like that, what you said mm -hmm. earlier about the sacrifice. It has been oh. so good to talk to yeah, you. Yeah, this is great. Really, Thanks, really good. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you? Oh, they can find me at um, my website's edwardsri.com, edwardsri.com. They can follow my podcast, which is with Ascension as well, yeah. All Things Catholic with Edward Sri. I always tell people, though, don't search SRI because you'll find an Indian Hindu guru. You have to put Edward <laughs> SRI and you might find me. Um, they can find me there, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. So. Would you mind leading us in prayer as we go out? Oh, sure. Yeah, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, thank you for your word. We thank you for the exodus, and we pray that you may, may bring an, an exodus into our own hearts, and may the, the sacrifice of the new Passover lamb, your body and blood, change us to help us to love and live like you. Mary, we turn to you, asking your intercession for us, that whatever's touched us here in the session today may, may bear fruit in our lives. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more amazing content on the Bible, be sure to like and subscribe.